The Gospel reading is from Mark 13, 1 through 13. Pew Bible, page 937. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. I've chosen to call that section of Scripture signs because of the way in which it deals with what is predicted before the coming of Jesus. Our entire uh, time this morning is going to be spent in Matthew 13, excuse me, Mark 13 and Matthew 24. So if you want to put your finger in both of those, uh, that will serve you as we bounce back and forth between some things. If you read my letter, you know that uh, this is kind of a postscript sermon. We've been talking through the Gospel of Mark, looking at Mark's drive to help us understand the conversion of the apostles or disciples. They start, as some of you have heard, many of you have heard, believing Jesus to be a great teacher, a rabbi. And then he's a rabbi with authority or a prophet. And so he's a Rabbi with Shmika, they call it. He's got the juice. He's got power. And then they discover that he's more than just a prophet. He may well be the fulfillment of what they've looked for. He is, in fact, the Messiah. And then we see Mark building the case as he employs terms that are taken from Daniel and Ezekiel and will be used again in Revelation as Jesus is portrayed in a priestly sort of way, a royal priestly sort of way. Son of man title is what Jesus describes himself as. And the disciples come to see that too. And then finally, son of David, identified so by a number of people. He is a royal king in the line of David, and we will see that too in his crucifixion. His crime, king of the Jews, posted right on his cross. And so this particular uh, direction finds its culmination in the declaration at the cross itself where the centurion speaks for the world. An odd choice but in Mark's gospel, a clear one. The disciples are continuing to learn who Jesus is, and at the time of the crucifixion, they aren't even there. They've already scattered. They've already fled in terror. The women are there, the women who followed Jesus, Jesus' mother, uh, uh, some of the other Marys that we read of in Scripture, uh, Martha. They're watching from a distance and are prepared to take his body along with a few secret disciples, like Joseph of Arimathea. But Jesus' twelve have scattered. 
and they're not there. And it is the Roman centurion who declares, surely this was the Son of God. And so this epilogue today, I'm going to try to incorporate materials from Mark, Mark 13 because in all of my years here, you haven't heard me preach much apocalyptic. It isn't, uh, it isn't my thing. And so um, I'm going to try to have it be my thing today because I think Mark does an interesting treatment of it and Matthew an even more so treatment. And it is instructive for us in terms of what is to happen between that time of crucifixion, ultimately ascension, and the second coming of Jesus, which we look forward to. Because remember, any Christian who looks forward to the second coming of Jesus is an Adventist. That's, that's how, we, how we see that. So in what was just read for you, Jesus makes an outrageous statement. Let's look at that uh, in the first part of 13. He's looking at a temple that was built at incredible expense and over a number of years. And the disciples are exclaiming about this pride and joy. Now, bear in mind, the temple they are looking at was built by who? Herod the Great. Herod the Great has built the temple that they're looking at, along with a lot of other palaces and uh, monuments and arenas and cities. Herod the Great is the uh, contractor. He has built the temple. And even so, the Jews are pleased. It's after the pattern of the temple that was built in the Reconstruction period, Nehemiah. Look, teacher, what massive stones... And if you've been to Jerusalem, you know the stones are massive. In fact, it's inconceivable how they have managed to get the stones on the Temple Mount to where they are. What magnificent buildings! And Jesus replies rather casually, not one stone will be left on the other. Every one will be thrown down. Maybe he was very serious about that, but he remarks on this, not yes, they're great buildings. Yes, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it wonderful that God's presence is in this place? He says, nothing will be left. Wouldn't it be tempting to say to Jesus, did you wake up on the wrong side of the bed this morning? Did you forget your morning cup of coffee? What's, what's going on, Jesus? You're not your usual self. It doesn't say anything more about this, but we know in other sections of Scripture that when people have heard this phrase, I'll tear this down and in three days build it up. He's accused of blasphemy. This is connected to that. Not a stone will be left upon another. He is now making a prediction of what will be physically, and he's also again referring to something that's not literal, but maybe his body. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, when will these things happen? They want to know. Don't you want to know? When I was growing up, I can remember the gas crunch of 1972-73. Anybody remember that? Okay, you're as old as I am. That's good to know. Lines, not quite. Peter's not quite as old as I am. He wants me to remember that. That's very important. Never will be. That's the truth. Lines around buildings and blocks to get fuel. I was so convinced that Jesus was coming again at that time, I didn't believe that I would grow up, let alone marry or have a family or anything else. And as it appears now, it looks like I'm going to grow old. Maybe. I'm lucky, right? When will these things happen? If you could ask Jesus anything, wouldn't you want to know, when are you coming again? When are you coming again? When will these things happen and what are the signs? So Jesus lays it out for them very simply. He says, see that no one deceives you because there are going to be many false messiahs. You think that was true? Have there been many false messiahs? Do there continue to be many false messiahs? Yes, there do. There are. I, I think today we have many false messiahs. Even within our own denomination, we have a few of them. They don't call themselves that, but they preach a gospel that's not consistent with the gospel of grace. 
not consistent with the message that Jesus brought, not, not consistent with the hope of our faith. Many will come in my name claiming I am he. Then he says something else. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. Such things must happen. I can remember looking through old library books in college, at churches I've pastored, even here, finding books by Maxwell written during World War II that saw World War II as the heralding of the coming of Jesus. It was surely the end of time. World War I was the war to end all wars, surely the end of time. And the scriptures say such things must happen and the end is still to come. The case will be this. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Earthquakes, famines. And what does the Bible say here? These are the beginnings of birth pangs. This isn't labor. This is the beginning. Wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, tsunamis, natural disasters, death, dying, destruction. This is just the beginning. This is the norm for the interim period. Nine, be on your guard. Be vigilant. Be watchful. This is going to come up again in Matthew as we look at Matthew. Be vigilant. You're going to be handed over to local councils and flogged in synagogues. On account of me, you'll stand before governors and kings and witness. And the gospel must be preached everywhere. That's the era in which we have sought to live. The era in which the gospel is presented to everybody. But guess what? We're losing ground. You realize that Islam is growing faster than Christianity globally. You realize that more people are being born than are being evangelized. And Christianity, while continuing to grow and continuing to be one of the great religions of the planet, has by no means succeeded in spreading the gospel to every nation, tribe, kingdom, language. We've worked hard at it. As a people, we've grown from just a few saints gathered uh, on rocks in New England in 1844, experiencing the disappointment of their lives, to being 19 million people strong worldwide in hun over 150 countries. We've succeeded brilliantly, and yet the end has not yet come. We've not yet finished that work. And right before that, it's very interesting what he's saying. You will be my witnesses in important places, and you're going to suffer for it. One of the things that I think is hardest to accept about discipleship and following Jesus is that it means in some fashion what he said, taking up our cross and following him. The way of the Christian life is not the way of ease and comfort. It has become that in the first world, but it was never meant to be so. Our witness is not to be taken for granted. It's to be held even in high places. Now we can see this fulfilled in the time of the apostles. Certainly they went before kings and prelates and were flogged and were disciplined and were ultimately killed for their faith, martyred. Certainly they spoke loudly. Their blood preached loudly for the cause of Christ. But since those times, yes, other Christians have died and been martyred. And today, in certain countries, if you're a Christian, you can be killed. We know that too. But the Christian witness has not yet come to us this way. You and I have not yet been put before important people, mostly. You and I have not had our tribunals. You and I have not been tried for our faith. You and I have not been beaten, scourged, killed. This is something that is yet to come. It's a thing we're afraid of. Lord, just get me through this time of persecution. Let me be one of the ones that stand. I don't want to have to suffer. I don't want to have to die. Verse 12, brother will betray brother to death and father his child. 
will sell each other out at the end of time. There'll be betrayal. Not everybody will be as committed to the cause of Christ as the other. And everyone will hate us because of Christ. And then it says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So we see vigilance, be on your guard, verse 9. And we see something else in here, don't we? Perseverance. When we look at Apocalypse, I just need to to talk for a second. When we look at Apocalypse, what we want to make it about is beasts and trumpets and interpretations and timelines, and there, there is all of that. Daniel Revelation has a lot of that. We want to make it about special knowledge that's somehow going to exempt us or help us at the end of time. And there is only one thing that's going to help you at the end of time, an unshakable faith in Jesus Christ. You can pack your house with guns. You can buy a Mormon pantry full of food. You can have antibiotics. You can have end-of-the-world supplies, and the end of the world will still come for you. There are certain things even you can't win over, certain forces greater than yourself. So you kill a hundred, what happens when a thousand come to you? So you have food for a year, what happens in a ten-year famine? So you have antibiotics for one illness, but two illnesses come. You cannot prepare for the end of time. You can only watch and pray and be vigilant and speak and be faithful. I'm sorry. Is that bad news? The good news is that what saves you now will save you then, and it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have earthquake supplies or that if you happen to be armed, that that's a terrible thing. Everybody has a right to defend their home and family. I'm not saying any of those kinds of pieces. I'm just saying this Armageddon mentality of I'm going to hole up somewhere and be able to defend myself against the world and I will be there when Jesus comes because of what I have saved and done. I find that a little bit difficult to swallow. You can pick up your piece of Revelation real estate in northern Idaho. Go ahead. We have spy planes and satellites that can read a date on a penny flying at 3,000 miles per hour. You will be identified. You will be found. The end of the world is not about you saving up for it or preparing for it in some sort of boot camp, military kind of way. It's about you coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ that's absolutely unshakable. Because Revelation, Daniel and Revelation point to Jesus. Jesus is the son of man of Daniel. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the coming king of Revelation. Jesus is the lamb that was slain. Jesus is the one of whom the heavenly hosts sing, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lamb. Jesus is the one who is worthy to un- untie the scrolls and unseal the letters. And all the things that you read about point to Jesus. When we teach the apocalypse, it's about Jesus. It's not a code that we're supposed to somehow uncover and have secret knowledge about that's going to get us there. I just want to be really clear about that. Jesus tells us to be on our guard, that is to be watchful, and he tells us to be persevering. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. And we persevere because of hope, because of love, and because of faith. And so my appeal to you this morning as we think about Mark's apocalypse in this very first section which I've entitled Signs. My appeal to you is that when we think about signs, we think in terms of not where are we, when will it happen, but we think of it in terms of awareness. This is the state of things. This is where we find ourselves. But the birth pangs will start, and the labor will happen, and the child who came will come. 
this time a glorious, victorious king. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to enter his house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in the winter because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short these days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened the time. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is. Do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, follow that distress. following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. This is an extremely challenging reading, and I'll try not to put you to sleep as I work with it. When you see the abomination that causes desolation, in the evangelical world refers to Antiochus Epiphanes. In the Adventist world, it refers to something else. I'm not too interested in that. What I'm interested in is the phrase, let the reader understand. Jesus repeats that phrase because it's a phrase that we find in the book of Daniel. Let the reader understand. There is a code that's being spoken. And I believe, and I think uh, most Adventists believe, that it has at least two fulfillments. When we read what is being spoken of here, we know that Jesus is referring to something that isn't far off. In fact, we get a sense of imminence. The challenge that we have as a people is we don't think he returned in 70 AD or shortly thereafter. We're still waiting for the parousia or the second coming. And so we have the first fulfillment in the destruction of Jerusalem. The apocalypse, actually, I'm going to suggest there are three fulfillments to this apocalypse based in where it's located in Mark. It's chapter 13 in Mark and the betrayal and crucifixion follow it. Same in Matthew. It's located in 2425, and the betrayal and crucifixion follow it. I'm going to suggest that part of this is fulfilled in the death of Jesus himself. That's a kind of apocalypse. Not, a, not one that we would typically talk about, but I think there are elements that fit that. The main interpretation might be, for this passage in Mark 13, the destruction of Jerusalem in 6970 AD. It happens quickly. The terms are very clear. If you're up on your rooftop, don't go down and get your cloak. Leave when the sign comes. Many of you have read of the destruction of Jerusalem. There was a very narrow window of time in which people could get out, and those who left the city survived. Those who stayed in suffered terribly and died miserably. It was a horrible time. It was a time of suffering like none other, except that that time of suffering keeps repeating itself in history. So we have that fulfillment, and we have one more. By the way, a contemporary example might be this. I, I like that, play, that show, Air Disasters. Anybody watch that on TV? Am I the only one who's fascinated with that? Oh, come on. Well, talk to me. I, know, I think I know about every crash that's occurred since about 1968, something like that. 
Anyway, I love uh, that show. And one of the things that I hope, if I'm on a plane with all of you and something happens and we're trying to get out, if you try to take your briefcase with you or whatever it is that's in the overhead bin, I am personally going to die with you on that plane. I'm going to pin you down and strangle you with that briefcase. Okay? You don't do that. You run for the exit. The thing is going to explode or the water is going to come in or something's going to happen. You don't take anything with you. When that moment comes for you to go down the chute, you go down the chute and you run clear of the airplane. That's what you do. That's what they were supposed to do in Jerusalem. There was this narrow moment of escape when they could get out of the city. And Jesus says it just as plainly as any air marshal or steward would tell you, get off the plane, don't take anything with you, go now, go now, go now. That's what, that's what Jesus said. Don't go downstairs, get your coat, don't pack anything up. Don't, you know, I wonder if I have Bob's baby book downstairs. I better go find that. Don't do it. Leave the city. That's what Jesus says. People who did, did survive. People who didn't suffered terribly. The third fulfillment is coming, right? The third fulfillment is that this is also descriptive of the end of time. And what we see here is now it's expanded from a, a group of people that are threatened with genocide, basically, with destruction. The diaspora of the Jews saves them from that. To the end of time when we're talking about all the believers, and the concern is that if the time of trouble doesn't stop, no one will survive. That's the severity of it. God has to come to intervene in that process. Nobody's going to make it. And in times of trial, there are always false messiahs that arrive, arise once again. And great things will happen through them. So we're warned again to be vigilant. We're warned again to watch. We're warned again to be sure of who we believe in. Jesus says that he won't be in that. If you hear, oh, he's in the desert, don't go there. If you hear he needs in the mountains, don't go there. If you hear that he's in a little village in Spain, don't go there. If you hear that he's in Africa somewhere, he's not. Because the next time he comes, he's coming in glory, and he tells us explicitly elsewhere in Scripture that he will not set foot on earth. We will meet him in the clouds. So don't get sucked in, Jesus says. Lots of things are yet going to happen, and at the time of the end, it's so terrible you can't imagine it. Now, I don't, I don't even know where to go with that. I know that there are people who suffer every day more than I can imagine. They suffer in prisons. They suffer with torture. They suffer in intolerable political military situations. They suffer in societies that are uh, without resource. They suffer in cultures in which they are oppressed by other cultures or within the culture. I know that there is suffering beyond my imagination right now. Groups of people who have experienced the end of time, as it were, right now. And that continues to happen. But apparently what Jesus is building to is a time in which if he doesn't, if he doesn't call it, no one's going to make it. No one will survive. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about. And it bears up my earlier point. No amount of water in your basement or food supplies is going to save you at that time. If the Lord did not cut short those days, verse 20, no one would survive, but for the sake of his chosen, he shortened them. The chosen being those who survived Jerusalem and the chosen being those who will survive at the end. And then he goes to something that seems to be, again, Specific, at least our church has picked up on it as a specific. The sun darkened, the moon not giving its light, the stars falling from the skies and heavenly bodies shaken. We have taken that and applied it to meteor showers, darkening of the sun and moon. We're talking about events in the late 17th century and in the 18th century. No, late 18th century, early 19th century. We, it, these are when we have pegged the fulfillment of these things as happening. Only great earthquakes continue to happen and meteor showers continue to occur and eclipses continue to happen and so forth. So even heavenly signs we can look at, we may not fully know from them when Jesus is coming. He says when all of this has been fulfilled, the Son of Man will come with great power and glory. 
and send his angels to gather his elect from the four winds, from the four ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. It's good not to read scripture too literally because we don't have a four-cornered earth. We don't have four winds coming at us from the four corners of the earth in a flat sort of tiered universe with a very different kind of cosmology than that. But Revelation is telling us something uh, remarkable as Jesus is speaking in this. He's revealing to us that there are heavenly forces that have been held at bay that at one time or another they will be unleashed and that his elect will be gathered from all of this. Winds of destruction and winds that Jesus will gather his elect from. I don't, I don't know what more to say about this passage. A lot more could be taught, a lot more preached. But what I want you to hear today is that Jesus is continuing to outline something for us. First of all, he's giving us some basic signs and principles. And he's telling us how dreadful it could be and how it's a time that will never be equaled once we've gone through it and never experienced again. How really it's not survivable except that the Lord shortens the days and how even the elect might be deceived by prophets who offer hope, false hope, false prophets. He's told us to be vigilant and to pay attention, to be awake. And what he hasn't said but is implied, because it was said explicitly earlier, is that if we endure, we receive the prize. And we endure because we stay connected to something deeper than this. We don't live out of a fear of distress. We don't live in the awareness of the hardness of the times to come. We live the message and the grace of our Messiah. Let me just take you very quickly to Matthew. Now, before I do that, I just want to hold up a book. This is called The Synopsis of the Four Gospels. It's a, you can look at it. It's in the pastor's office. It's my personal copy, but um, it's a common book. And what it has is Greek and Hebrew side by side, and then it compares translations of the Greek and Hebrew in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John so you can see what happened with particular words. And it's very interesting because Mark was written before Matthew was the timeline of the Gospels. And we can see this apocalypse here in Mark 13 mirrored in many ways, not exactly, but many of the words and phrases are used in Matthew. And so Matthew's apocalypse is related to Mark's, and I think that's a point of interest for us today because if you'll hop over to Matthew, Matthew gives us something even more practical than Mark does. He gives us many of these same signs in Matthew 24. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah. That's verse 4 and 5. He says, uh, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from its sc- from the sky, and heavenly bodies will be shaken. 29. At that time, the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and the peoples of the earth will mourn. Very similar to Mark's gospel. If you read Mark 13, Matthew 24, you'll see lots and lots of parallels. And then Jesus, at the end of Matthew's gospel, goes on to tell us that no one will know the day or the hour, and then tells us a few stories. Tells us a story of the ten virgins. You remember it? They're waiting for the bridegroom to come. The hour becomes unusually late. Some of them realize they're running out of oil. They want to borrow oil from those who have oil. Those who have oil say no. They've trimmed the wick of the lamp and been very cautious with that. Go buy oil. So they go buy oil. And while they go buy oil, the master comes at an unusual hour, an unpredictable hour, and takes everybody into the wedding feast and closes the door. And the virgins who had gone to buy oil show up, and the master won't let them in. He says, I don't know you. So in a nutshell... That little parable, that story of what's happening at the end of time, 
can be interpreted at least two ways and helps instruct us on how we live in the time of apocalypse. First of all, the vessel could be our faith and the oil, the love through which our faith is lived. And when we run out of that, our faith dies, our light and witness dies, our relationship has grown stale and cold and old. And that happens to a lot of people waiting. We grow complacent. We grow weary. We're not, we're not vigilant anymore. A more common Adventist interpretation of that, that would have been John Wesley's interpretation, a more common Adventist interpretation is that oil is a symbol of what? The Holy Spirit. And so when you're low on oil, you're low on what? The Holy Spirit. So there's some sentiment, some thought that says, look, you've got to have a constant indwelling of God's Spirit to sustain you as you wait. We're afraid of that, aren't we? We're, we're afraid of the Spirit. We pray for the latter rain, but we're afraid of the Spirit. We're afraid of what the Spirit is going to require of us in our lives and what it means to be that connected and that aware sometimes. I, I believe that. I think we are deeply afraid sometimes of the Holy Spirit and quick to offend. And the, the story Jesus says, tells us is that if you want to be wise and you want to endure, you don't live in fear of that. You keep your vessel full of that. The oil of the Spirit is what gets you through to the end of time to that wedding feast of the Lamb. Either way, we have an admonition to endure, to wait and endure. Next story is the parable of bags of gold. Five talents, two talents, one talent. Now, I don't have time to comment on all of this, but I want to just point out that this is what Matthew does with this period of time. And what this story tells us is that the one with two and the one with five talents invested them and grew them and doubled their money. Four talents, ten talents, respectively. And the master came back and congratulated and rewarded them and called them good servants. And the one with one talent buried it and said, I knew that you were a harsh master taking where you have not sown, or excuse me, taking from you know that which you haven't built and, and reaping that which you haven't sown. What that person is saying, if we read the parable carefully, is that he doesn't know the master. Jesus is not a harsh master. What does the scripture say? My burden is easy and my yoke is light. If you think Jesus is a harsh taskmaster, you don't know him. And so the one with one talent is not just stripped of that talent, it's taken and given to the one who has ten talents, but he's cast into the place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's judged. He's judged not because he didn't have a lot of talent to begin with, he's judged because he didn't do anything with it. And given what he thinks he knows about the master, he didn't even act prudently. If you knew that the master was harsh and expected something, at least Jesus then says sarcastically to him via the parable, then I would have expected you to put it on loan to the bankers and at least have drawn interest. The Bible describes it as usury because it was not the practice of the time to loan. You read your Old Testament, you know that. Or to draw interest. You gave or you forgave. There was no in-between. And if you loaned, it was without interest, but the year of Jubilee then paid you back. If, if possible, by the year of Jubilee, you'd be paid back. And if you hadn't been able to pay it back, it was forgiven. That was the idea. You came clean every seven years and especially every 49 years. The system was designed so that people didn't use one another, not like today's 23% interest credit cards. Jesus is getting sarcastic with this particular lazy servant and says, well, at least if you think I'm a usurious person, you could have gotten me some usurious interest. 
The parable means this, take your talent and use it. You want to know how to live in light of the apocalypse? You want to know what to do at the end of time? Use the gifts God gave you. Can I be more direct than that? Do what it is God has equipped you to do spiritually and what he's gifted you to do naturally for his kingdom, for his work, and he will bless. That is one of the things Jesus is telling us to do. Last point, sheep and goats. There is a judgment, a judgment of the man who is not wearing the wedding robe of the lamb who enters the feast of the lamb and he is cast out. We wear the robe of the lamb because it is the righteousness of Christ. That is the meaning of that parable. That's one form of judgment. The other form of judgment is ethical. I was hungry and you fed me, naked and you clothed me and all the rest. And we can apply that two different ways. One is physical and one is spiritual. Both groups, the sheep and the goats, say, when did we see you in this condition? And both times Jesus says, when you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. Yes, we have a physical obligation to care for the naked, the hungry, the imprisoned, and so forth. That's important. That's ethical. We have a spiritual obligation to care for the vulnerable, the confused, the trapped. That's what we have to do spiritually. This is what Jesus tells us to do at the end of time. And he tells us that this is actually going to be a criteria for judgment. The separation of those who have responded to him in the least of these and those who have not. So when we think about apocalypse, particularly Jesus' apocalypse, we mustn't leave out these three stories, even if we're just talking uh, about what Mark builds up to. Because these stories help us know how we're supposed to live in this particular time. We live in faith. We live in action. We live in diligence, in observance, and he will save us for the sake of the chosen. But about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son but the Father only. Be on guard, be alert, and pray, for you do not know when that time will come. It's like a man who goes away and leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. And if he should come suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. By now you can see the similarity and the difference between Mark's apocalypse and Matthew's. Mark ends with this admonition, watch. We don't know the day or the hour, according to Matthew. According to Mark, we don't know when the master of the house returns. If he's asked us to keep watch over his house, he shouldn't find us asleep when he comes. He shouldn't find us negligent. He shouldn't find us with our work undone. And this is very much in keeping with what I was just sharing with you from Mark 20, from Matthew 25. This is how we live. We don't know when he's coming. No amount of study of Daniel, Revelation, the apocalypses of the Gospels, Ezekiel, no amount of study will show us the day or the hour Jesus makes that plain. We have taught the soon coming of Jesus for 150 plus years, and we don't know the day or the hour. What we do know this, 
Jesus says the master will return. Jesus says the day is coming. Jesus says he will return in glory and take us to be with him. Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. Jesus says, I'm the beginning and the end. Jesus says, watch. Don't be pulled one way or the other. Don't be swayed by false teachings and false messiahs and fancy tricks. Don't fall asleep while guarding the door. Do your master's bidding. Work your talents. Keep connected with Christ. Build that relationship and that faith. Live in the Holy Spirit. Watch and pray. And one day it'll happen when we least expect it. I don't know what else to tell you than that. I don't know what level of study would give you greater insight than that. You can do that for yourself. Today, what I want to leave you with is the knowable uncertainty or the unknowable certainty, either way. The unknowable certainty is the time in which he comes. That's the unknowable. And the certainty is that he returns. That's it. He comes and we don't know when. And so I want to leave you with that this morning. I want to leave you with the unknowable certainty that we can know that Jesus is coming again, that he loves us, that he's redeemed us, that he's saved us, that he's going to do everything he can at the end of time for his elect, that it's not going to be a time we can imagine the difficulty of, that none of us would survive it if it weren't for his intervention. These things we can know. The rest? No but we can live until he comes. So I pray for you as I preach this epilogue to Mark's gospel and the conversion of the apostles, as I preach this last sermon on Mark with you, as we look at his apocalypse and then look at it through the eyes of Matthew's apocalypse, I pray that God will keep us, that he'll bless us, that he will put us in the place where we can speak of him and that his words will be our words, that he will keep us faithful unto the end and to that day, that he will help us to be vigilant, faithful, to work his vineyard, to develop our talents, to occupy till he comes. I pray that you will be there because if you're not in heaven, I'm not sure I want to go. That's the way it works, you know. The family of God doesn't triumphantly march through the gates. Let me paint a picture. Brennan Manning paints this picture. The family of God at the end of time wraps their arms around another, one another and limps in broken humanity through the gate. And it is God who will make us whole. We limp to the finish line together because that is what God has done. He has saved us not just as individuals, but as a corporation, not just as a denomination, but as a people, as a planet. He's reconciled the whole world to himself, and all we need to do is let others know that he's not like some have said. They too have been reconciled to God they need only wake up and accept it. And we wrap our arms around them and together we will limp through the gate of the kingdom of God. Yeah, I don't want to be there if you can't be there. I'm not sure it's worth that. You know, Moses felt the same way. You know, Moses said to God, if you're going to destroy these people, destroy me too. 
or destroy me in their place. So I'm not setting a precedent. I'm not being dangerous here. I'm not being flippant with God. I am praying as I speak to you that God will help us all to reach that day, whatever happens in the meantime. Because he wants you there far more than even I do. Let's pray. Lord, save us to that day. May we live in your spirit. May we do your will. May we watch and be vigilant. May we be diligent. Keep us in prayer. Fill us with yourself. May we know you. Keep us alive through your spirit. And help us always to speak your word to this world and all your people in it. Thank you for calling us, for choosing us, for loving us, for blessing us, for gifting us, equipping us. And may we put our arms around one another and march to that day. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.